Live from Boston, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering Red Hat Summit 2015. Brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back to Red Hat Summit, everybody. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Wikibon's live coverage of Red Hat Summit in Boston. Marco Bill Peter is here. He's the Vice President of Customer Experience and Engagement. Gave a great keynote this morning. Marco, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you. Okay, great so to be skiing here. Yeah. or biking, what's, uh, what's, what's your favorite? Oh, actually do both. Both, <laughs> like one do you do in winter, skiing and, and uh, snowboarding. It's perfect, and then right? mountain biking. Well, you ride, too. Yeah, yeah. Snowboard. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. yeah or yeah, skiing, yeah. where do you both, ski mostly? Both. Where is your favorite place in the world to ski? You know, I have to say, you know, I, I grew up in Switzerland, and so I always was kind of saying, oh, this, this U.S. skiing is kind of like lame, right? Especially <laughs> East Coast. Nouveau but, you know, skiing. But then, you know, like I discovered Sunday River. I love Sunday River. But this year, and then it's kind of like, I'm not going to the West. Why would you do that? Yeah, I saw your sticker there, the Ski the East. I saw it, yeah. <laughs> but then, like this year, I have to say, I went to the best skiing place. was at Jackson Hole in Wyoming. And I just was like, I kind of like, I gave up on European skiing. Like, yeah, oh, Luke over there, <laughs> Luke says ski the east, but of course he lives in Colorado now. Yeah, and all that. So, kind of, yeah, so yeah, great yeah, keynote yeah, this good, morning. Yeah. I think you actually would look good as a blonde, by the way. <laughs> I was blonde for a while, and then, uh, yeah. I love that story. You said, hey, it's rock solid, no bugs. You find bugs, you know, I'll shave my head. Yeah, I set and the yeah. bar too low, though. It was, uh, it was just too low. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a good competition. It's kind of like, I mean, in the end, it's for the customer experience, right? Whatever we find before it goes GA or general availability, it's good, right? And so it was good, kind of a joke. I was like, well, let's do that. And then uh, it was, I think it was easy for the team. They got 50 and they enjoyed it. They kind of hovered around 55 and then I was blonde for a while. <laughs> And then uh, just a few days before, it was like, okay, this is the limit. They pushed it through, and so I said they were teasing you with uh, the blonde. They Wh wanted to which see was actually hard yeah. because you know, like the blonde wasn't wasn't my thing. But then, uh, so I wanted to shave it as quickly as possible, <laughs> and uh, they kind of enjoyed that for a while. But it was good. This is good, and uh, you know, it helped in the end also. I think to make the product a bit more stable. So I loved your story. Uh, you know, many of us have read the Jim Collins book, Good to Great. What makes a good customer experience and what makes a great customer experience? I think great customer experience is really where you have the collaboration and the engagement, right? Good support can be many things, right? It can be the reactive support, can be like standing behind you if there's something on going on, but preventing issues, really working with a client to actually build the next innovation. I mentioned the keynote, that elevator company, right? I mean, you think about an elevator company, right? They, they are a manufacturing company. All of a sudden, they got to do this software engineer. And you see many companies today in a very traditional business, all of a sudden, they got to be a software company, right? And they got to innovate, right? And all of a sudden, this open source thing is coming. And so I think we, we, we have made that as a Red Hat consumable for the enterprise, but we also got the way that hey, we can interact with customers in our open, open and collaborative way. And I think that's great support, in my opinion. Yeah, right? so well, you sort of gave the example of, you know, good support is when, you know, there's a problem and you react very, very quickly, you're on top of it, great. But great support is, you're proactive, you can predict. Yeah. How do you use data to be more proactive? So, so that's a really good point, right? And we have built internally Hadoop clusters, really like big data, in a way to figure out, okay, what are the trends, what's going on? And you know the knowledge that we have, we also use in support in the in the good support. Our support is not just like you fix an issue and you move on. It's actually every issue creates knowledge. So every issue in the support engineer first searches. If they can't find it internally, they start creating basically an article. And it's, so you create content on the fly. And this is the, what I mentioned in the the keynote. There's millions of of content that we have that describes the problems in the language of a customer, not the problem that the engineering person sees. Well, if the code goes here and here, you get this issue. It, it explains in, in the voice of the customers and like, if I do this and this, that happened. And so from that knowledge, we do a lot of, I would say, anal an analytics as in like, you know, what comes up and what, what's kind of a trend, right? And, and you know, like in, in the past, I always, I always had that feel, okay, uh, one customer starts calling us and then there's a few customers that call in the same issue. And actually, instead of just having the gut feel of that's happening, ha having actually the data model that kind of tells you, hey, this is going on, and then to create rules and to lead into the Red Hat Access Insights, actually 
provide these rules back to the customer as in that they can prevent it. I think that's where, in fact, to like using data but also being really great support is if we can prevent these. And we're going to talk about your announcement, but I want to sort of unpack the philosophy a, a little bit more. You, you, you publish your, your phone number on the website. You encourage people to call you. Uh, unlike the airlines, trying to get the hold of the airline last night. I couldn't even, you can't even find the number, you have to Google six or Or you're like searches. one hour on the hold, right? Well, like it was actually yeah. two hours last night, oh, was it? Uh, but they had a nice service, they could call me back. So they called me back yeah, at that's, that's they call me back better, at midnight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. what are the touch points? How do customers, they want to interact with you, I presume, different ways. Some people want to call, some people want to chat, some people want to search. How do you handle those different channels? We can, you got to offer all of the channels, right? And that's what we do, right? And, and like, like a few years back, it was, much more heavy on phone, right? There was like, I think 60% 60, 60 phone volume, 40% electronic, like portal or, or chat. These days it's 90% on the portal and 10% is maybe phone. And our actually outbound phone is much higher. So we, in many situations, if we, we are not clear what's, the, what, what's really going on, we encourage the engineers, well, call back, you know, going, Maybe us older guys kind of use the phone still, but it's a really powerful tool if you use it the right way. Call back a customer, hey, what is going on? Figure it out. So, but yeah, phone, phone, I think has an importance. It's kind of like making sure things get resolved. Electronic is powerful because then you get also the data. You get the data, hey, what is the customer experience? It can upload the log files. We have, uh, even if you create a support case, a very simple example, but we will scan whatever customer uploads us and against known issues, and it can help against solving issues much Oh, and faster. you're getting a click stream. Uh, and now, it, it, now, when you say portal, does that include chat, or is chat sort of No, it's all integrated. It's all integrated in the portal. And you, know, you say click stream, right? It's the analytics about, hey, who is using what. Right. It's, it's very powerful, and, and from a company perspective, for us it's powerful to know who is using what, and also like in some cases, if we see a customer that buys from us, but then never downloads from us, it's like, well, what's going on? And so we're kind of starting to engage these customers as well, as in, hey, are you struggling to download the issue, the software? Are you trying to do something? And so that's kind of more proactive engagement versus waiting till a customer struggles and to call them. So, and that's where analytics come in quite handy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm envisioning, you know, chat is interesting, right? Because a lot of times when you, when you interact in chat, you can tell there's canned responses, the person's got six chat windows open. Yeah, you know, it falls apart. Now, you yeah. described, you don't have a sort of waterfall tiering approach. You organize it by the problem, or yeah. you describe yeah. that a little bit. Yeah, so we, we use swarms. Instead of the layout model, layout support model, in my opinion, it's, it, it can help in certain cases. And, and there's some corner cases where I would say, okay, that works. Like, language support, right? If you yeah. want to provide support in, in Spanish or France, French, right? That might actually be better for having like a, a language team that does it. But otherwise we actually uh, group the, the engineers, the support engineers around small technology fields. And they're small as in virtual memory, you know, CPU loading or, you know, pick your favorite. It's not even like a product. It's really specific areas. And that allows these engineers to be much closer to the technology, but they're also aligned with engineering much better, so they know each other, right? And you know, like that's still, we're still a company that, that matters, that you know, like the engineer works in the same swarm than like the development engineer, and they have, a, they have a really good connection, if that's electronically or even by phone. That helps, I, I tell you, this helps a lot. So it's the, a different model. So the simple math would say if you sell a subscription um, and they never call you, or they never use that subscription, and you make more money. But you, you, no, you yeah, have a different philosophy. That's a totally that's a, that's yeah, the yeah, opposite yeah, of what yeah, really happens. Yeah. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm not happy about that because if somebody doesn't use it, I don't know if the customer is happy. I don't know if in a year the customer will renew. We don't know anything about that customer. So for us, is that's why we drove this whole engagement to understand is a customer actually satisfied? Will they renew? Right? And you know the products are fairly good, so not everybody uses support. And so that, or the tactical support, reactive support, that's why we started in, uh, providing an engagement platform and understanding who is, who is using it. And you know, okay, I'll give you an example. Most customer, or new customers, when they struggle with all, you know, kind of the first two months to install the software, get it up, 
they will not renew because that's the hardest part, right? It's, it's kind of well known in the industry. Subscription business is the first one month, two months is critical. And then you get them on board and then you got to kind of look at the utilization. If you look at the utilization, it's a really good point to kind of see, okay, they are using it, they're happy. Okay, renewal is, is um, no, it's not guaranteed, but at least you know, hey, we have track record that the customer uses the product. Well, the power of that subscription model from an economic standpoint is enormous. Um, I've said, I mean, I term it as Red Hat's renewal rate from a revenue standpoint is over 100%, right? If you look at your yeah. average price is going up, you're well, cross-selling, cross yeah, exactly. you renew, if you renew yeah, 90 yeah, whatever yeah. percent yeah. of the customers and they're paying more, you're at 115% renewal rate from a revenue standpoint. Yeah. It's a very powerful it's awesome. model. It's awesome, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we also got to make sure that that happens, right? If the renewal rate is so high, you got to you got to do something. There's for an it, expectation. Right? And there. You, yeah, exactly. You yeah. got to know how that how that happens. And it was interesting to hear you describe, juxtapose your model relative to the traditional, you know, software the license, license up front yeah. and the maintenance model. The maintenance is like, oh, we don't have to work for this. There's they have to get the maintenance exactly, you know, they're right? Locked yeah. in. Yeah. And even you know, usually that's just cost, right? They're optimized for cost. You know, like I've been in that business as well, but it's not a good. You know, like if you are an like, executive of support, you know, I don't want to be in janitorial services, right? It's like you want to be in a company that puts that in oh. the business, right? That's oh, in the core business and makes it actually something. Hey, this is meaningful, and so that's why I'm so happy here. But I think it's also the right DNA to actually look at customer success. Now, the disruptor here, oftentimes, you know. Somebody said yesterday, they, I think it was Cormier, they sort of ignore you, and then they laugh at you, mm -hmm. and then they fight you, and then the you The Gandhi win. quote, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> the Gandhi yeah, quote, right? Yeah. Um, so, but, so they ignore you, but now that you're a, a larger company, you're having great success, you're, you're disrupting people, they start to pay attention. Yeah, they Not don't ignore you, us. But others, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. then they start to copy you. He left that part out, Gandhi did. So in our business, they copy you, and they try to you know, market you know, around you. Yeah. So, do you see that model, that old sort of license and maintenance model, it's changing, cloud is changing it. Yep. Um, people, I think the large companies are realizing, wow, this subscription stuff, if we can manage through that transition, not so bad. We actually, we actually make more money. Yep. So they're starting to realize yep. it. So do you see that changing? Do you see I more mean, competitive Yeah, yeah. I, mean, you, I think you see it as well, right? I mean, I think there was last week an uh, earnings announcement from a company in California that tried to describe the, the whole after the earnings and the kind of like the subscription model, right? And I think for a lot of traditional companies, that's really hard. It's not explaining the subscription model, but kind of even mentally move from a license model, high margin maintenance model to like a subscription model. And especially in our case, the days around open source, that is pretty cool. And so what you see is a lot of proprietary companies are trying to, you know, they don't ignore us anymore, right? 10 years ago, 15 years ago with Linux, it was like kind of like, yeah, just, We'll let them do, the Raleigh company will let them do something. Yeah, cute, <laughs> sounds great, the penguin, right, sounds great. Not anymore, right, with OpenStack you see it. But the, the, so, and then you have this comp proprietary company, they're mixing the models, right, they kind of like, they still have the license model in mind, but then they throw some open source somewhere, and, and I think that's, I think I mentioned that the keynote, it doesn't lead to the pure DNA that you actually embrace it. And I think for OpenStack and for the industry, it's really tricky. If everybody does their own OpenStack distro, I think Paul described it quite well, we'll end up in the same thing we had in Unix. And I was in the 90s doing Unix as well, but every Unix was differently. And then having a, a strategy around containers that you can move a container from one OpenStack implementation, that won't work, right? And so I think the next few years will be really interesting to see what shakes out. Yeah, I mean, the whole container conversation makes it dream from a support Standpoint. If I got, you know, hundreds, whole, whole hundreds, cloud makes it pretty, cloud, quite interesting. Yeah. You know, the, if I have hundreds of thousands of containers, <laughs> he, he gave the example of, you know, the virus, the swarm. I mean, the uh, the the heartbleed Heart virus. Bleed, yeah. Wow. Now, if well, I've got, yeah. you know, hundreds of thousands of containers, you guys got to be on top of your game. Uh, you got to know what's in that container. Yeah, you better know what's yeah. in that container. Because you better be able to. Uh, I think that will be a big stretch, right? I mean, I think this leads to what we saw in Linux as well, right? You have these repositories, right? These RPM finds where you can download open source software. If you, as a corporation, do that, you better have a strategy around, hey, how do you manage this open source coming from everywhere? And this, I think, is with containers as well, right? If you're a bank, you want to know what's in that container. 
what application, what kind of around the container. In like, you can, you can, if you don't know that, it's like not even a support problem. It's like a whole compliance issue. How do you manage as a company? How, well, how do you uh, manage those containers? That's a big, that's kind of the next wave, isn't yeah, it? I mean, yeah, and how do you avoid to make containers heavy by putting too much stuff into the container, but go to a model that you can certify them and inspect them as in like knowing what's in there. Yeah, the advantage mm -hmm. of containers is they're lightweight, but then you start putting all those capabilities in, you're going to make it you know, bloated, yep. right? And, and, then, and, and then you add complexity, yeah, which yeah. makes your job harder. Well, yeah. your job's going to be, the complexity's going up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. even though yeah. the end user, you want some simplicity, yeah. but. Yeah. Well, I think some some stuff will be easier because you know like with containers you can probably split the pl application down to higher reli uh, resiliency by actually having mm -hmm. like multiple functions kind of going on at the same time. So maybe from a reactive perspective, maybe the impact is not as high if you use containers correctly. But I would say the first few years, this will be an interesting mm -hmm. journey. And you know, like a lot of customers. They are not bleeding edge, right? There's like we have a lot of customers experiment with containers, OpenStack, but you also have a lot of customers. They got to run the old IT, right? Or Gartner calls it the, the bimodal IT, kind of the, the old stuff. Most right? customers, yeah. are by definition. Yeah. 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 yeah, but talk about bimodal IT for a second. I, you know, bimodal IT, good concept. Bob Gartner does a good job of sort of creating these good concepts. But the problem I have with bimodal IT is like create more stovepipes. Yeah, yeah. We got yeah, the no, old yeah, stovepipe yeah, and we got the, the new stovepipe. Stove Which stovepipe do you want to be in? Yeah, yeah. Nobody's going to want to be in the old stovepipe, so I'm not sure that that's the right organizational yeah. model. I, plus, I plus it leads to like, I mean the data, you know, how do you connect the data from the old model to the new model, right? I mean that's... So you need to have I don't bridge. think the model, I, I, I mean it's an interesting model, it kind of describes what you see, but it's not as simple as... Uh, and you got to have a bridge. I mean in Red Hat, is a bridge to that new world. I mean, you don't yeah, want to over-rotate to that new exactly world. Exactly, right? And I think a lot of customers want to have, I mean, I think that's what the keynote from Paul talked about, you know, like some applications only run on bare metal, right? I was talking to a customer this week, of, oh, it doesn't run on virtualized. But then you have some, you got to run it bare metal, virtualized, public cloud, private cloud, right? And, and having that capability to move, mm. I think that's, I think that's more describing than the old IT versus the new IT. And I think, We'll see. Some companies move to the public cloud. Some actually, you know, uh, private cloud is probably more appealing for data security or customer data security, privacy. Um, it will be an interesting. Well, journey. we love yeah. to talk about disruption in our business, but it, our the customers, you know, viewers, that's where the really interesting disruption is going on. I want to talk about uh, Access Insights yeah. Yeah. announcement that you made today. What's it all about? Take us through that. So Access Insight is basically very simple. It's taking, you know, I gave the example in the keynote about navigation system, right? Navigation system tells you, hey, there's a traffic jam in Boston, happens every day. This is the route, you can avoid it. It's very specific, it's specific to your car. It's not specific around the whole Boston area. And basically that's what we want to try, to basically get our knowledge from our interaction down to certain rules that if you're driving from there to there and you're hitting this traffic jam, this is the detour that you got to take. And that's what we want to provide in a way for our, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux first, six and seven. And we'll deliver the, the console in, um, in um, satellite, the portal, cloud forms. But basically what it does is a customer connects to us and provides minimal data around packaging, like an inventory of, hey, this is the packaging, this is some configuration data. A a in a secure way, you know, like uh, many customers already are connected to us with satellites, so this kind of extension from that. And then we match that footprint, that inventory against known issue that we just found. And basically give exactly a dashboard back this is a security issue you're hitting, availability issues, reliability issues, and right now it can be around Linux, but it can also be a combination of our Red Hat Enterprise Linux and the firmware that you have and the hardware, and kind of describe if you do this, and th we had a firmware issue a few months ago with one of the hardware vendors, that now we can be proactive and say, this box is exposed, that box is not exposed. And that specific recommendation, that's the power of it. It's not just a broadcasting as in like, 
you got a need. Oh, we, we, found, we Red Hat found a new security issues. Go figure out yourself if you're exposed or not. Yeah, That's yeah. not good enough. We want to yeah. be specific on that. Either figure out if you're exposed or just spread it everywhere and who knows what else it's going to mess up. And this, yeah. those aren't good choices. I mean, how many notifications do you get on, I don't know what your desktop oh. is, right? But you get like hundreds of good update this and this. It's like, why, right? And if you yeah. can be, be more specific, you got to change this configuration file because you will hit this problem. Jim Whitehurst uses that example from the airline industry from, I don't know which, 787 or one of these airplanes that has, they got to reboot the systems every 208 days. And they know it, obviously, they got to reboot. And there's many, oh, kind of frightening, right? If you know that they got to be, got to check out the seven. Yeah, which airline is that? And uh, how long is that flight <laughs> going on? And so that's the similar thing. There's a lot of issues that we know it's time-based and, you know, or the, the configuration I mentioned today. This is stuff a customer could know, but they don't do anything and they run into it. And we're giving the specific, we're giving them the specific recommendation. Hey, this is something you got to do. And, and Access Insight is, is available today? Today, yeah. Today and they can download it, they can play with it, and in the next RHEL 6.7 version and 7.2 version, it will be implemented and they can use it in production. But we have customers in beta for the last seven months, and uh, yeah, I'm excited. I yeah. want to see next year how this really turns out. It sounds, uh, it sounds like the, the ways of, you know, the ways, IT The ways of you IT. You had to be using ways because your normal GPS wouldn't work that no, way. No, actually I had, I have a good car, so it was yeah. the, the regular one. Uh, but yeah, Waze nice. would be the one that ex actually works. <laughs> Tesla, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right, awesome. It was electric, <laughs> it wasn't Tesla. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right, good. Uh, so now I have to ask you, so how is that How's the pricing model work? It's just part of the subscription, or is it a upgrade to the subscription? We're still figuring that out. We will, I'm sure we will have a certain element that's free, or included in subscriptions, yeah. and there's probably an opportunity that we'll do actually, hey, some advanced services around it. But for us, it's more important, right now it's important, let's drive this as a subscription value and then we'll see where we take it. All right, Marco, we have to leave it there. It was really a pleasure hearing you in the keynote this morning. Thanks so much for coming Thank on theCUBE you. and sharing your insights. It's been great. Great, thank you very much. All right, Thank keep you. right there, everybody. Yeah. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from Red Hat Summit. We'll be right back.